some of our students come from a nursing background, some are pharmacists, physiotherapists, and they'd be quite interested to hear probably what interventions you do on the scene. You mentioned that you, you take blood sure, yeah, yeah, from yeah. anaesthesia and things. Would you like to describe more about what happens on the Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean we um the MRS, we, we like to think of ourselves as, as well, this is, not, this is what we do. We, 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 we bring a, hospital, a, 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 a teaching hospital level resuscitation room mm -hmm. to the patient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that the same kind of facilities that you've got if you live down the road from one of the big hospitals in Glasgow and Edinburgh will be made available to you with the best of our ability wherever you present in Scotland wherever you present and as soon after you need it as possible which kind of applies to the patients who as I said before are maybe isolated and remote not because of their geography but because they're critically unwell because of injury or severe illness but they're still in their home or they're still at the roadside or they're still trapped in the car so instead of waiting for that patient to get out of that situation come to the hospital that's what we bring so what what does that involve you obviously there's a limit to what you can take out in those circumstances but we take out the life-saving interventions so certainly uh, the capacity to provide emergency anaesthesia is important for that. Uh, and that's of relevance to patients, particularly who've got um, traumatic brain injury, who may be unconscious, who need their airway protecting. We're able to bring that airway protection and control of their gas exchange, their respiratory function, to as soon after their injury as possible, with the intention of improving their outcomes. We are capable of doing minor surgical procedures, or actually some of them up to major su surgical procedures. So. If a patient has pneumothoraces or chest injuries, we can definitively uh, manage those by uh, doing thoracostomies or putting chest strains in. Uh, in the case of penetrating trauma, we're able to do a, an emergency thoracotomy if the patient's dying of pericardial tamponade after a penetrating injury, stab injury, for instance. And we carry blood. And we, we know if you, you present with trauma to a hospital resuscitation room now and you're bleeding and you require transfusion, we try and give you blood products, we don't try and give you clear fluids. So we as a team are able to carry blood and if that's indicated, give you the, give you the best possible uh, intervention. And I guess the other thing we, we bring, which is maybe a little bit harder to measure and show you a piece of equipment that we do, is we bring experience and expertise Many uh, road paramedic crews won't see a patient with major trauma very often, six, once every six months, once a, once a year, something like that. Whereas because we get deployed to all of these, we see a lot of it. Our uh, retrieval practitioners and the paramedics we work with on the helicopter uh, are very comfortable in the environment and very good at managing a scene and working with other agencies. So we bring that kind of level of comfort just to do the basics well and the level of clinical assessment, which means we're able to prioritize the care of a patient in terms of judging how quickly they need extricated, where they might need to be taken, what inventive interventions are right, when it's right to take our time, when it's right to do things in a hurry. That level of expertise and oversight, as well as supporting the crews at the teams and, and able to kind of offer a bit of education and support as well. So there's a lot that we bring. I was wondering, um, I'm not sure at all, if you have portable scanning equipment up any kind that, that you take with you or is this something in the future that might? Uh, no, we, we, we routinely carry portable ultrasound yeah. uh, which augments our capacity to make clinical assessments and to do procedures like for the remote and rural patient rather than the pre-hospital one certainly um, putting in invasive monitoring, central venous access, running inotropes and vasopressors, that sort of thing. You know, doing what you would do if a patient was admitted to an intensive care unit, we can take that if you present to a community hospital on Isla or the isolated general practice on Tyree, you know, um, and you present there in need of that, we, we take that and give that before we bundle you up and put you in a helicopter, uh, which is definitely an ad advantage to yeah. Yeah, critically ill patients. I was interested when you said um, obviously it's more challenging at, at night. Yeah, um, yeah. What adaptations do you make to, to the service to provide for patients at night, or what, what do you think is the future for provision? In sort of in the dark. Yeah, yeah, the hours of darkness. I mean, it's, it's, it's the aviation challenges as much as anything. For, I mean, for the remote and rural work, most of the um, aviation side of things is kind of, um, it's, it's, it's more limited by weather than it is by darkness because you, you're going into surveyed landing sites with lighting 
Uh, you know where they are, they're pre-surveyed, it's safe to land a helicopter or you're, or you're landing at an airport with the fixed wing aircraft to go and retrieve a patient for remote rule. However, pre-hospital uh, is a different thing entirely. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, from the civil aviation perspective, it's, it's all categorised under the, the, this, uh, the term called HEMS, which stands for Helicopter Emergency Medical Service, and there are kind of alleviations of, of flying rules to allow for HEMS. But, um, Doing what we call a night, doing what we call night hems, brings particular challenges because you are flying into a landing site that nobody's ever landed at before, and even during the day that presents some hazards. So you see the guys wearing the red suits and the helmets and things, and that's not kind of you know, there's no sort of fashion element. Of Those suits are flame retardant. The helmets are there to protect you because there's recognised risk in landing in unsurveyed landing sites mm -hmm. uh, and so those things are to kind of mitigate that risk in case there was an incident and the, mm -hmm. you know uh, and we're all kind of trained and comfortable kind of operating as a, as, a, as a crew as part of the helicopter crew to keep their eyes out the window shout out any hazards to the pilots we work very closely with the pilots so it's not just a matter of sitting in the back as a, as a passive passenger in these instances yeah. you're participating in, in bringing safety to the overall aircraft and uh, the people within it so you can imagine uh, landing on at night when wires, electrical wires, fences, trees, lampposts, all these things are much more difficult to spot because with its own challenges. There are procedures that the helicopter pilots and crew up front go through to, to make these things safe. They wear night vision goggles. There's a little bit of a slower kind of activation to out the door response at night in that there's a time taken to look at the maps, look at the scene and, and plan an approach to the scene. Uh, and also when you arrive at the scene, there's kind of fly over a few times to kind of survey where, you, where you're going to land. Uh, and whether you're going up with Helimed 5, the, the yellow helicopter that the ambulance service runs, a single pilot operation with, a, with an upskilled paramedic in the front doing all of that, or whether you go up with the Coast Guard, which is a twin pilot operation with an observer in the back assisting, all of these safety considerations are the same, and it just make it a bit more challenging. Of course, then you arrive and it's all dark, and you're doing everything by headlights or head, head torches and, and uh, fire crew. So you can that's that's not too difficult to imagine. It makes things a bit more difficult as well. Sure. I was wondering um, when you're training um, for, for such events, is there is there simulation in the dark, or how do you plan question. for this? Or in the future, will you be training people this way? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I mean, you know, wherever possible, we, we like to train in conditions that, that simulate what we're doing. So when we, we do our daily simulations at the base, if we're, if we're simulating a pre-hospital scene, then we'll try and be imaginative about that and you know, take a mannequin and find a cupboard and pile things on top of them if they've had some sort of industrial accident or take them out to a car park and use vehicles and that sort of thing to, to bring added realism so that we're... We're training in the environment we can, but you're right. Actually, you know, maybe maybe doing things in the dark would be a, a good thing to do, but it's not something we do at the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the yeah, absolutely. Uh, what other future plans do you have, and how do you see the service growing? All right, that's um, yeah, that's a good question. I th I I think we're in part in a in a period of consolidation of the service. So there's some acceptance now, which took long time for people like my colleague Stephen Hearns and, and other people along with them to a, achieve, which is that, that doctors and an advanced critical care team needs to be part of an ambulance service that is tasked with conveying patients safely to a hospital to get definitive care, that within that there's going to be patients that need advanced critical care. And, and seeing ourselves as an established part of that overall service ambulance service and air ambulance service in Scotland, and we've got there. And the Scottish Trauma Network is embedding us as part of the pre-hospital pre response to that, and that is great. But there are other elements that are maybe coming with that for the future. So we are now as a team becoming embedded as part of the national risk and resilience side of things. So one of the things that we're skilled at is major incident response. All the, all the doctors in the team get some training in attending a major incident. Uh, we've got well worked out procedures for upgrading the level of our, you know, the, the level of our response in response to a major incident. And, and again, it's that part of that centralisation agenda that you know, major incidents are maybe not quite as uncommon as you think, depending on how you define them. You know? And 
we're attending most of them and we're gaining the expertise. So the days have gone where you kind of send a flying squad out of the nearest hospital to attend, you know, not really ever having an experience of recognising that the, the MRS team has that experience. So that's, that's definitely part of our future. And more widely, we're certainly the team that is comfortable and experienced in moving patients who are critically unwell, certainly by air, but possibly arguably um, by other modes of transport. And it may be in the future that we need specialised teams to, to look after any critically ill patient who's having to go into the pre-hospital environment, even if they've already been in a hospital environment as part of the kind of transferring of, of patients around. But that's, that's for the future. And um, it remains to be seen what the drivers are of that time. The Scottish Trauma Network's taking up a lot of energy at the moment, and consolidation around that is probably the, where we're at in the short term. Mm -hmm. You mentioned resilience there. Mm. So your teams, including yourself, are going out to patients with horrific injuries, let's be honest, with traumatised patients, yes. perhaps more than one, yeah. um, in the dark, possibly in, in horrible weather, uh, to unfamiliar environments, and perhaps their own safety. Yeah. Um, might be at risk. Yeah. Uh, in terms of resilience, how do you all take care of one another and make sure that you're well and continue to enjoy at work under, yeah. these, under these settings? That is a really, really good question. And there's some answers to that. We're a pretty close team, actually. Although there's you know, 26, 27 consultants, mm -hmm. all the retrieval practitioners, we all know each other, we all know each other quite well, we're supportive of each other. There's a real kind of strong culture of recognition that we do something that can be challenging, stressful, sometimes risky. Mm -hmm. And there is a kind of strong team, team culture and ethos around looking after each other. And yeah, people are challenged by that from time to time and I think we all, there's, the, along with that kind of team ethos, there's a recognition that none of us are invulnerable to being affected by that. Mm -hmm. So there's an acceptance of the fact that some of us might from time to time have a bit of a struggle mm -hmm. and that it's not an admission of weakness to accept that that's the case. There really is a culture of that amongst the team. So I, I don't think anybody would ever feel stigmatised by seeking help or seeking support from, from peers with regard to that. So that's really good. And it, and it does go to you know, where the one of my responsibilities I mentioned earlier about being in a responsibility, having responsibility for team leadership is kind of making sure that we don't lose all of that in amongst the changes that are ahead is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And that said, actually, we are, it, it's not common that we're affected or struggle with these unless there's a really, really significant event. And one of the questions I've had to ask myself is wh why is that? And I've talked about some of the elements of it, but. It's, some other elements are things like, you know, we have a culture where we always debrief every job. And we're in a service where we have the luxury of doing that because we have a job that's punctuated by periods of standby. So we have the opportunity to come back from one job and then reflect immediately on it. But that is very much part of the culture. And after every job, even if we're stood down before we even get to a patient, we will debrief with the team that's involved, with that the pilots and the helimed crews, or just with a, 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 a team of two who have maybe responded by road and sit the job with a, with a two-fold objective. One is to kind of to give, give opportunity for personal reflection, identify learning within the job that can be fed back both on an individual level and change practice or make changes in the service. So it's part of our kind of learning structures, if you like, for the service that we improve, or constant quality improvement. But I think part of that means that after every job, whether it's a challenging job or a very routine job, we have that debrief. So it does mean if you have struggled or you think you've been a bit affected by a job, you don't have to put your hand up sure. and say, well, oh, can we debrief this one because I feel a bit... Yeah. <laughs> it just happens anyway. So there's always that opportunity to decompress after jobs. And I think that's really important. And there's other elements of what we do that I think contribute to team welfare that enhance that kind of team support culture mm -hmm. that we perhaps haven't yet identified. And one of the things I worry about is that if we haven't identified them as doing that and labelled them as such, how do you protect them from the changes that are ahead? So we are working with outside agencies who've got experience in this field to help kind of identify what those things are and maybe kind of define a structure, a more formalised structure that somehow puts into words the things that are there mm -hmm. that might be vulnerable if you look at things from a cold clinical resource allegation perspective. 
but if you label them as being fundamentally important for team welfare, then we, we, can, we can protect them a bit better going forward in the future. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm glad you all look after each other. It's <laughs> like an amazing team to work for. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for people who, who want to join in, in, in the future? Yeah, well, the future is really important. And you know, a number of us have been involved in, in the service and hope to be for a good time, good time still, but um, we need new blood coming through, coming through at the other end. That's, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, we're going to be around for a long time. The service is, is, is doing nothing but grow. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is a training pathway now that in the UK for pre-hospital emergency medicine uh, called the FEM pathway, P-H-E-M, um, which is a, an intercollegiate intercollegiately governed pathway that people from emergency medicine, anaesthetics, intensive care medicine can do that kind of bolts onto their base CCT in whatever the, those specialties are. Um, and you can certainly aim for that and, and doing that certainly puts you in a good position to work within our service. I would say though that it's not the only way. The service in Scotland is, our service is quite unique, certainly within the UK. It's got commonalities with other services in other places like Australia, New Zealand, Scandinavia, uh, because of the remote and rural work that we do. So we're not just pre-hospital emergency response and different to many of the other services in the UK, our missions are long. Um, our average length for a remote and rural retrieval is between four and six hours. In terms, so that's a long time to be looking after one patient in, a, in an isolated environment. And you know, for instance, the, the, the job I was involved in recently that, that we talked about and with relevant to it, it took us an hour to get there by helicopter, mm -hmm. and we were trans we look after a patient for an hour in the helicopter on return, and that's very different to a lot of what the other services do in the UK, mm -hmm. purely pure hospital emergency medicine. So, we provide critical care and on an aeromedical platform for quite sustained periods and there are other routes to acquire those skills and it may be that sometimes we need to look at people who are very skilled with regard to critical care and emergency medicine and have the right aptitudes and team working approach but need upskilling with regard to the pre-hospital environment or the aeromedical environment and, and bring people in in that way. It's so I, I'm not sure if that's easily answered easily answered your question. People further back in the training, yeah, you, you're not really going to come to this from a background of general practice or internal medicine. You need to be looking at an acute specialty. And it's a bit niche, uh, so it's maybe not a great thing to put all your eggs in one basket, expecting that you're going to have a consultant career working the service. But there's lots of opportunities to do this for a short time, be it in the UK or in Australia. And I'd recommend anybody to do that, because the skills you learn working in our environment are highly transferable to any other kind of acute setting and, and of great benefit. Yeah. OK, lovely. So it's just really to, to open up to yourself. Is there anything else you're really no. dying to tell us no. about? No, I've, to waffled. Talk about I've waffled enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much okay. for today. It's really, it sounds like really exciting work, and uh, we'll look forward to the future. Thanks, Emma. Thank, thank you. you.